By the year of 2035, Artyom has explored almost all of the accessible metro stations within Moscow, as well as the land above it. He has made the areas relatively safe again with his Spartan brothers as they stop the Red Line from taking over D6 and the rise in the Fourth Reich. But as he continues to live down in the dark and claustrophobic world of exhibition, he would go on to discover a radio signal coming from outside of Moscow when on one of his patrols. Desperate to seek out what it was, he would convince his wife Anna to come with him to a restricted area that was strictly forbidden to find that signal. And on that route, they would encounter a train going outside of Moscow, revealing that there was life outside of the city. After fighting through and getting to the train, Artyom along with his close Spartan friends, as well as his colonel, would take the train and explore the lands around the city, venturing into Kazakhstan as well. It would be on this trip where the Spartans would encounter new tribes and factions, with very strong views and unique ways of living, that at first would shock the Spartans, but after a while they could see parts of themselves in these people. So who are these factions? How have they set up and what was their past? Why are some hostile and what are their end goals if they have any at all? Well in today's video we will be exploring all of the factions the Spartans come into contact with during the main story of Metro Exodus and try digging out some of their backstory to help flesh them out some more. These are the factions of Metro Exodus. Early in Artyom's journey after first discovering the signal and venturing out to find what was causing it, he and Anna would find that there were operations happening on the surface where troops would go in and out of the area and would appear to use military force to secure the area. Getting captured by these individuals, they would first appear to be other Spartans, making Artyom and Anna feel comfortable in their presence. However, it became clear very quickly that whilst these technically were Spartans, they worked for a much higher power. Before the events of 2035, the hands were another big power within the metro stations, running a lot of the markets within the circle line and located themselves within the center of Polis. After the battle of D6, Colonel Miller desperately needed to bolster his Spartans once again as they had lost too many in the battle. Here he reached out to the Hansa and got them to agree to his deal. This would allow the Hansa to come into the Spartan ranks and help bolster their forces, meaning that the soldiers who encountered Anna and Artyom outside within the restricted area near the train were in fact Hansa Spartans who had recently been brought into their ranks. But whilst the Hansa were a force to be reckoned with and could certainly handle themselves, a much darker force was running them as well as the Spartans themselves. Whilst always mentioned as rumour and quoted as being legends who would quote, appear to take over control during the events of Ragnarok, this group would in fact be present within the Moscow metro area. This group would be known as the Invisible Watchers. The Invisible Watchers are never seen in the games however, but their name is heard multiple times. This mysterious group was supposedly the remnants of the Russian government who had escaped the Great Wall. The main rumour was that they were legendary godlike creatures who roamed the Metro 2 line, observing everything and controlling each and every station. The main goal of the Invisible Watchers is quite clear, that is to maintain control throughout all of Moscow, manipulating events around the people living there to make sure everything goes to plan and the people do not look to seek out those in charge and take out their frustrations on them. They sound like a standard government, however there was a catch. The Invisible Watchers were adamant on keeping people under control. They would never want a situation where rebels would seek them out, find out how they were the remnants of a government and hit back against them. Because of this, the Invisible Watchers set up each of the factions seen within 2033 and 2034. These being the Hansa, the Red Line, the Fourth Reich and all of those within Polis, including the Spartan Rangers. These factions would be their puppets and with them they would set up conflicts to distract the population and give them a way to hit back their frustrations on something else that wasn't the government. This also allowed them to maintain population control. Sending people to war meant there could never be a huge growth in population, meaning resources could always be maintained. But ultimately the Invisible Watchers were the cause of everything within the metros between all of the people. As Artyom and Anna explore more throughout the Hansa base it becomes quite clear that the Invisible Watchers had cut off 
enough all outside contact to create this lie that only they exist and they had been controlling and manipulating all of their lives. Destroying the signal jammer however meant that they were all free to hear the signals again and reach out for help. But doing this it became clear to all the factions under the invisible watcher's control that they were at risk of having their schemes shown to the world and could be the main target here. This is the sole reason Colonel Miller turns up with his Spartans to fight those intruders who had stolen the Aurora and broken the restricted area rules. Siding with his daughter however it became clear that there was no way they could return to the Moscow Metro as they would be a target everywhere they went. As 2035 progressed on however it's quite clear to Artyom that the invisible watchers were and still are controlling life within the Metro station back where he lived and now they had found a green bit of land to regrow maybe it was time to venture back and expose all of their lies and corruption and free the people from their captivity and bring them to the outside world. But for now, the Invisible Watchers are still out there, hidden away, controlling all those underground with their main goal being just to maintain power and control. As the Spartans finally get out of Moscow and escape the clutches of the Hansa, the crew would venture into the area known as the Volga. The land was frozen over, bandits roamed the area capturing locals, demons roamed the air and watchmen sought out prey to eat. However, the first group outside the walls of Moscow that the crew would meet would be seen as an overly religious cult who had blocked the nearby bridge and located themselves within the nearby church. This group would be called the Church of the Water Tsar, who would be extremely technophobic and and would worship the nearby giant sea creature that would be aptly named the Sarfish. Run by their cult leader Salantis, this group would see anyone using anything electrical as being filled with sin and would be condemned by them. Some within their community however are a bit more open than their leader and their loyalists being more welcoming to those with different views or being a bit more curious about objects such as radios for example. This doesn't mean they completely shut themselves off from the outside world however. Most of the time this cult will do trade with outsiders but when they do they will see all of those with incredible suspicion and if they get too bad of a feeling about them, they will become extremely hostile towards them. If one was to join the cults, they must renounce all of their technology, which will be taken off of them and either destroyed or stored away in a nearby terminal, so it can be supposedly purified by the Sarfish. But this group isn't the most peaceful of groups. If an individual were to go against the rules of the cult and embrace technology, or even show some form of interest with it, they will be punished by the cult and will be forced to do dangerous and almost suicidal jobs such as exercising electric demons who roam the land which makes for quite an entertaining sight if you were to witness it. It is pretty unsure where exactly this cult formed from however some notes found on Artyom's adventure paint a picture of their leader and his background. It is believed that Salantis was part of an unnamed political party before the war hit and also with that it was believed that he could have also been incarcerated in a mental asylum for his specific beliefs. Before the setup of the church it was said that Salantis went around claiming he knew exactly how to stop the electric beasts that were hurting people. And that was through the use of lightning rods, which he would refer to as charms, which would completely destroy them if they came close to one. Whilst the charms did work, Salantis stated that the only way they could fully stop them was by giving up electrical technology, completely cutting off their power and lifeline supposedly. Because of all Salantis's claims and his use of charms, with people not knowing what they really were, the church grew in followers as they truly believed he was the one who could help stop the attacks from the electrical anomalies. The recording on this historical log did say however that Salantis is not dumb and knows how to manipulate people in such a manner, maybe because of his past within a political party. But it worked and his cult started to grow, with people really believing that he was there to save them. During this time, time a group were travelling from the southern Urals. This included the young nurse Katia and her daughter who were all in search of a better life. As they arrived on the train they were found by the cult and were taken captive and their train was taken to be purified by the Sarfish. As the church killed all of the other members, Katya and her daughter were kept alive and imprisoned within the church. Her husband at the time was also sentenced to die as he was sent on an exorcism mission as punishment for using technology. But there was another reason really. It was pretty clear that Salantis wanted to in fact marry Katya and because of that used 
any excuse to kill her husband and remove him from the equation. Whilst the marriage didn't go ahead, Katya and her daughter were kept within the cult and were forced to help them. Salantis, however, did not allow Katya to heal the cultists, leading many to die from illness. With the Aurora arriving, Katya and her daughter would be rescued as the crew encountered their cultists and their leader, doing everything they could to get the bridge open for their train and crew. With the crew eventually going through after a face-to-face -face with Salantis, it's quite evident their society would continue, with their worldview of technology being sinful continuing on. It seems like things will continue like that until Salantis dies or someone takes them out. However, finances seem to come from their control of the bridge, demanding ships going through the Volga to pay taxes. Even if you were quite well prepared, the Church of the Tsar have heavily equipped paladins and can use everything in their disposal to capture you and your technology and sentence you to death at the hands of either the Tsarfish or electric anomalies. Colonel Miller from the offset wanted to find the government located outside of the Moscow metro station. Getting in contact with the Ark, the crew would venture there, believing they were in fact the true Russian government. However, they were wrong, and instead, this Ark was set up as a Venus flytrap situation and would capture the crew and keep them as food. This group would be the Ark Cannibals, a group of survivors who were originally working on the Ark Bunker, which was to be the government's shelter. However, the war came earlier than they expected, and because of it, all of the workers, soldiers, and some generals were trapped there, away from the outside world. At first, the situation was fine. Food was plentiful, and security was better than anywhere else. But that food quickly started to run out, and they needed a solution to this. As they searched for an alternative, the group opened up the community communication relayed to the outside world once again, but instead of reaching out for help, the group would lure individuals in, saying they had shelter and protection, then when they got there, would beat them to death and eat them. The doctor within this facility would start taking over the role of leader, treating all of the people's conditions and tending to the cooking and processing of meat. He would also be one of the only ones left with higher thoughts after eating human flesh, with most of the regular constructor workers reduced to primitive individuals, only knowing one word and becoming overly aggressive to anyone in their way. Eventually though, the Aurora crew would overthrow the doctor and would wipe out hundreds of cannibals within the Ark, escaping the facility facility in the nick of time. Whilst it's clear some still survived within there, it's pretty safe to say that without their leader of the Doctor, most will perish and will not be able to continue on like they used to, especially as those within the communications room have also been wiped out by the Aurora crew. For now, the Ark just stands as a tomb for all of the workers who used to work there, and its insides show how isolation and lack of food turns humans into desperate beasts. As the temperatures got hotter for the crew of the Aurora, they would quickly find themselves within the desert area within the Caspian region. As the crew slowed to a halt, they would witness a vast abandoned wasteland filled with wrecked boats, oil rigs, and crumbling buildings. But also with this, they would witness a new threat to them. This would be a group of bandits, known as the Munyai Bailea. This group would pretty much be seen as any other type of bandit, the only real difference being their aesthetic. Their origin is pretty vague as well, with the group being said to be around 700 raiders that are made up of ex-soldiers, mobsters, Svarog oil workers who have somehow been able to secure the area of oil reserves and hold it for themselves. What makes this group so powerful, however, is the fact that they are one of the only factions out there in the wasteland that people know of so far that have access to working vehicles and access to machinery to keep them maintained for day-to-day -day use. With this power, they were able to capture the locals of the area who had also been ex-workers or just traders part passing through, and enslave them to force them into doing their work for them, such as maintaining buildings and their land. Ultimately, due to their access to vehicles and machinery, this would enable them to fight off other bandits to become the dominant power within this area of the Caspian region. Their leader, known only as the Baron, runs the operation, with strict rules in place to make sure no one goes against them, which has made sure that fear runs amongst the land. It was believed that the Baron himself was either a high-up member of the Sparrow 
an oil company or just a general employee for the company within this area before the war. However, when the war broke out and the world went into a lawless society, the Baron rose to the occasion and made the land his own. He also campaigned to say that the reason for why he was doing this was to civilize the supposed primitive tribes within the land and give them an overall purpose. Even believing that slavery is better for those people than what they were living like before. And with this set up the religion this group would follow called the Holy Flame. However, with this strong rule being played by the Baron, this would set up strong opposition with some individuals within the area. One being Ghoul, who lived in the area before the war. During the Great War, Ghoul lived in the Caspian One bunker within the area with her mother who worked in it as a researcher. As the bunker started to fall apart, both of them ventured to the surface once again and set up their life once again within the lighthouse above the bunker. But sadly, as rations started to get less and less, her mother would venture back down to the bunker and would sadly perish. This left Ghoul all on her own, looking for a purpose to keep on living. And after seeing her people being enslaved by the Baron and his bandits, she sought to hit back raising resistance fighters to try and overthrow their regime. Over time, however, the resistant fighters faded out, leaving just Ghoul to fight back against the Baron's forces. The other opposition the Baron faced was his high-ranking commander within his forces, called Saul. Saul's plan was to overthrow the Baron, and whilst Artyom and Ghoul started to fight back against the Baron's forces, Saul saw an opening to conduct his plan. Here he would form a plan with Ghoul to kill the Baron, then behind her back would find a body double to pose as the next Baron, claiming he had been resurrected by the Holy Flame and was back to rule the land, demoralizing the slaves and making it so no one went against them again. With this body double, they would be just a puppet ruler, and in the end, Saul would be the true ruler. In the end, the Baron of the Munai Bailair would meet his end, but the future of the bandits would ultimately be down to Artyom and his decisions. But for the time being, with their machinery and vehicles, this fact was able to dominate the Caspian region and enslave all those who went against them or was a native of the area, claiming it was all in the name of their religion, the Holy Flame. As Artyom and his group ventured forward even more through to Kazakhstan, they would eventually get to an area that looked perfect for the group to set up in their new green life. However, getting to this part of the world, Artyom, while scouting the area, would fall into the river nearby and be saved by a mysterious group of individuals. This group would be known as the Children of the Forest. This faction were just kids back in the days before the Great War. When the war did hit, this group was stranded whilst on a scout camp and had to live their life with what they had on that trip. Luckily for the kids, they were left with a single adult who would help teach them and guide them, and with this would be labelled as simply the teacher. Thanks to the teacher, they were able to develop their skills in survival and were able to take on any threat they faced from changing weather conditions to bandit attacks. By 2013, the children of the forest had officially set up their own tribe and with that, chose to wear primitive clothes made from anything they found looking like nomadic tribes of the past. The thing that made them stand out the most, however, was the members wore masks made out of the skulls of mutants to instill fear in the hearts of their enemies. With all this set up, the children of the forest would of course stay out within the woodlands, not wanting to venture anywhere near the urban areas as their training only helped them live out within these forest areas. Eventually the group set up a justice system called the Forest Court that is to judge outsiders and trespassers to see if they had hostile intentions or not. If they are seen as friendly, they would be able to venture through the land being unharmed. If they are deemed as hostile, they would be imprisoned or executed. But despite all of those things set up to deter hostile individuals, bandit attacks continued on, killing a lot of the members of the group. This led the children to have conflict within their main group with the individuals believing conflicting views of the teacher's lessons. With this, the group split up into the pioneers and the pirates. The pioneers being a peaceful group who were quite isolated and would only kill bandits, letting most passers-by go through their land. The pirates, however, attacked anyone they did not recognize and would also actively loot anything they could, whilst also ignoring the justice system put in place multiple times. For the most part, these tribes continued to live the way they knew for a good amount of years. However, as Artyom and his crew arrived, it became clear that this area was not safe, and if the children of the forest stayed there, they would all be wiped out very fast. It would once again be down to the actions of Artyom to save this group 
from the upcoming doom they were to face. And if they were to listen to their cries, the children of the forest could move on to greener pastures and continue to live their remote lives for years to come. The two other factions are the Oscom within Novosibirsk and Tom's army within Vladivostok. Whilst I will cover their basics, I covered these two within my other videos, so if you want a more detailed look into their lore, then do check out my other videos. Oscom, however, were the task force that were responsible for the defense and evacuation of Novosibirsk during the Great War. This group would ultimately try and solve the situation, but were not fast enough to save everyone, and lost many troops and civilians as the city was hit with an extremely potent Colbat bomb. Unlike the Moscow metro stations, Oscom were to be the one and only ones in charge, making sure resources were handed out to everyone and order was held. But sadly, as the anti-radiation medication known as Green Stuff started to run out, panic started to form within the metro stations within the city, with civilians getting angry at the authorities as strict rations took place. Eventually, things got so heated for this group that rebellions started to take shape and war started within the metro stations. Oscom started to be overrun and a new plan started to take place where an evacuation of civilians would be taken to more green land, with some of the high up generals being amongst them. However, as this plan went ahead, the generals of Oscom betrayed everyone and set off tanks of chlorine gas, wiping out everyone from Oscom soldiers to rioters. In the end, only a father and son survived, but searching for a map to green land where they could move to, Colonel Slava left his son behind and sacrificed himself in a hope to find a new land to live in with his son. This whole event would show Colonel Miller why the Invisible Watchers set up multiple factions to distract the hate away from them. But for now, Novosibirsk lies as a tomb, littered with the bodies of civilians and soldiers who just wanted to seek shelter away from the bombs of the Great War. And lastly is Tom's army, which does not have much of a backstory at all, but is key into the future of the series. Tom, before the war, worked within Russia after moving there from Seattle. After the bombs fell, he started gathering large stockpiles of pre-war fully manufactured weapons, as well as armed mercenaries under the leadership of his right-hand man, Clem, and ventured all over the country. Eventually, they got to the city of Vladivostok and saw that it was powered by a pre-war nuclear submarine, and if they acquired that, they could take out any bandit camp they wanted and make sure no one double crossed them. Moving into the city it didn't take long for them to take over, promising protection from the local bandits in return for living within their city. Tension started mounting with the captain of the nuclear submarine as Tom eventually took over command of it, hoping to use it to expand his business and win over others to his cause. By the year of 2036 Tom still commands the nuclear submarine, however without its nuclear fusion cells he is unable to get it moving and fully operational again. Reaching out, he would seek the help of a fellow American Marine who was once a Spartan Ranger known as Sam. Once again, it would be up to Sam to judge who Tom is. Is he trustworthy with a device that could cause yet another nuclear holocaust? Could he be a friend who could let him travel back to his homeland? That will be down to Sam's judgment. But as the submarine looks on into the distance within Vladivostok, and Artyom and his crew look on at their new home, the world outside is looking much larger than it once did all those years ago down in the metro. Who else is out there within the wider world? What other factions could the groups find in their travels? Will the Invisible Watchers return and hit back against the breakaway Spartan Rangers, or will we see a new, bigger threat out there within Russia or East Europe? Only time can really tell. But for now, these have been the factions seen within the open world of Metro Exodus. And those other factions seen within Metro Exodus, whilst they don't have a lot of lore to them, I hope I was able to paint a bigger picture as to who they are and why they behave the way they do. Also, if you want a bigger picture of the Oscom, Tom's Army and the Cannibals, then do check out my other Metro videos. Links are in the description below. But I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do leave a like, a nice comment and subscribe if you haven't already. Check out my other lore playlists and let me know what other topics you'd like to see as well. Also, if you really, really like this video, why not support me 
me on Patreon or as a YouTube channel member for early access to my latest videos, as well as them being completely ad free. And speaking of which, I'd like to thank my supporters real quick. Big thanks to our small fish guys, our big fishes, Sacrum, Christopher, Andrew, Last Persona user, and Arto Krim, our shark, Well Such Gaming, and our huge megalodons, Sinus, Jacob Garcia, Chernobyl Stalker, Shadow SGT, and Ryan Everett. Also, big shout out to our YouTube channel members, our wise ones, Jambu and Fiery Italian, as well as all my amazing subscribers over on Twitch if you still exist. All your support means the world to me and means I can make these videos for you guys, so thank you all so much. But that is all for now. Thanks so much for watching. Stay safe out there. Show each other some love during these horrible times, and I shall see you all in the next one. Cheers.